Good morning. Welcome to Soul of Travel. So excited today to be sitting down with Tamika Harvey of the Black Travel Alliance and Passports and Grub. Uh, we connected so many months ago. I don't even remember exactly when that was. Um, and I have just been anxiously awaiting to bring some of what we shared in that quick conversation to all of my listeners and um, just get a little bit further into the discussion. So thank you so much for joining me today. And I would love to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about, I know that you kind of are like me and you wear a lot of hats, <laughs> but maybe introduce um, your work with the Black Travel Alliance and with uh, TBX, and then we'll dive into Passports and Grub in just a little bit. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so again, I'm Tamiko Harvey. Uh, I am the owner and creator of Passports and Grub, which is a luxury travel blog for women of color with disposable money to spend and we're trying to go places. Uh, I am also the uh, director of TBEX North America, which is one of the largest travel conferences for content creators. Uh, we have a conference in North America. We have one in Africa, Asia, and Europe annually. And I am also the vice president of the Black Travel Alliance, uh, which uh, kind of holds, not kind of, but does hold travel brands accountable for um, not marketing to uh, Black people other than for in February for Black History Month. So you want our money, but you don't want to use us in your campaigns. You don't want to pay us equitably. Um, and so I am uh, on the board of the Black Travel Alliance as well. And thank you for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here and to chat with you about all things travel, about race, family, health, anything that we sort of want to dive into today. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I, one of the things I loved most about our initial conversation was that we kind of just were able to ask all those questions and really just be honest and vulnerable without worrying about offending anyone or we just were able to have a real sincere conversation and so I knew right away that that was a space that I wanted to bring to this conversation. And also, I, I love that you started by thinking about um, the way marketing intensifies during Black History Month. And when we initially booked our interview, I just put you on the next available date, which was February, even though I think we were talking in like December or something. And then I realized that it was, in fact, Black History Month. And at first, I was really excited. I was like, oh, well, that aligns beautifully. And then it was a little bit actually frustrated because I have had this weird balance of like, do I honor that by bringing those voices in during this month or do I honor my brand and, in, and just wanting to include voices all throughout the year and I didn't want to look like I was hopping on this like marketing trend. Right. So I love that you kind of opened with that because that's one of those uncomfortable or awkward conversations that we have as brands, as humans, <laughs> trying to navigate this space. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on, on what that looks like or what that conversation might be, particularly with a brand and how you would navigate um, advising a client on creating something in that space. You know, for me, I think it's great to highlight, you know, Black people, Black businesses, Black travelers doing February. But what I, where I think most brands miss the gap is that they start thinking about it in January. And so there's nothing wrong with wanting to highlight a Black History Month, but don't make it a last minute effort. Um, and that is something that I got from my counterpart, uh, Martinique Lewis. She's the president of, Black, of the Black Travel Alliance. And she always talks about it's okay for brands to highlight Black things, Black businesses, Black travelers, but don't let it be a second thought. Everybody knows Black History Month is February all year round. 
why are you just putting together your marketing plan in January? So I think that when brands start to really understand the why behind it, and even with, with marketing to black people in general, if brands don't understand the why that it's needed, then it's really just a trend and it's something to check the box off as opposed to ingraining it in your business as you would with any other group. So you know you need trade fund dollars, you know you get your marketing money in October or fourth quarter of, of, the, of the current year, you should be allocating those funds to market to black people and you don't have to have a completely different marketing campaign. You can use the same shoot, just add some black people to it. Mm -hmm. Add some Asian people to it, add some Latina people to it. It doesn't have to be a completely different, you just don't need to have, in the world that we live in, and we're so, it's such a really more than ever, we are a multicultural society. And I think that most brands, most people that work in marketing, they are probably white women and we hire people and we work with people regardless of what race you are. If I walk into a room and I see there's another black person in the room, automatically I'm gonna make eye contact with them and I'm gonna be like, oh, there's another one over there and I'm gonna go over that way. That's just something innate in us that we hire, we, we navigate to people that look like us. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that that's that unconscious thing that we do when we are in marketing and we want to automatically hire someone unconscious that we say we need a family. I need a family to do this marketing campaign. Automatically, I'm going to think I'm going to hire somebody that looks like me because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And so it takes longer to say, OK, I have this person, but now I need to also find this person and this person. So then that requires you to do the extra work that you probably really don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. And, and I mean, something I was aware of in general in social situations, but hadn't really applied directly to a business, but that, that definitely makes sense. And I mean, I think when you're talking about the why, um, obviously there's the financial impact. And this is when I, when I first, met you or started researching you and I saw the statistic about how you create diverse travel campaigns because of the um, African-American travelers contributing $63 billion to tourism in 2019. And I was That's like- old number. So we just did a new study that just came out late. Um, after we talked, the study actually came out. So that number is no longer 63 billion, it's 129 billion. Wow. And MMGY, um, which is the largest marketing and uh, travel marketing and PR firm in the US and in the UK, uh, completed the study along with the Black Travel Alliance. And so that number now is $129 billion. And especially in this time, can travel brands really afford to say, oh, I don't want to market to black folk. Yeah, I mean that that just was a huge number and really um I, I hadn't I just hadn't thought about it, period, but like seeing that number, I hadn't ever guessed, like, you know, I haven't broken it down that way. Um, but it, it really made me think, and I'm a very small business, so I don't sit down with all of my numbers and crunch them that way. But if I were a larger brand and I saw something like that, I would just be like. I would be pretty mad at my advertising department that they were missing the mark. And um, I know we had also kind of talked about like kind of uh, busting myths or these common held beliefs. And one of them might be that, that black travelers can't afford luxury travel or um, certain types of travel. And so I think that statistic really shows that that's not true. But if, if we could talk to maybe why that exists or how we can get around that as an industry? Like, what do we need to change in our perception to make that uh, a more of an understood reality? I think, it's, I think it's unconscious bias. You know, Black women especially are the most educated group there is out there. Um, and we have disposable income. Uh, we don't do hostels. Uh, we like luxury travel. And I think that, 
you know, it's just the perception that the media has always given to black people that, you know, we're struggling or, you know, we're on welfare. Nobody I know is on public assistance. Everybody I know has an upper degree or they're an entrepreneur and they are doing extremely well for themselves. But I think if you look at the media and you look at the news, and if you don't have any black people in your life outside of your work friends, mm -hmm. then you will believe what is being fed to you via social media or via the media. Um, one of my day colleagues, one of my, I have a day job as well. And she came to me and we were having an honest conversation, um, you know, about, about this exact topic. And I said, you know, it's okay for you to come to me. I said, but how many black friends do you have outside of me? And she was like, well, I really don't. I said, well, you, she said, I really don't really know anybody. And I said, well, you really don't know white people when you meet them either, but somehow you have a ton of them as your friend. <laughs> and I said, I have white people as my friends. I have Asian, I have some Latina friends. I said, so, you know, why is it that you're on, that the only black friend that you have is one that you work with, that you feel comfortable enough to ask these, com these, these questions to. So I think we need to expand, you know, our relationships with people that are around us. If everybody thinks like you and has the same mindset like you, you can agree to disagree on fundamental things, but you still should have people around you that come from different backgrounds, different races, different religions. Even my daughter, um, last year she came home and she said, uh, Ma, what is uh, Hinduism? And I know nothing about Hinduism. I've never studied it before. I don't know anything. And I said, I said, I don't know. And then she said, well, one of my classmates um, practices Hinduism. And I said, well, why don't you start researching so that you can speak articulate to your friend. Uh, and so it, you have to have people around you. If we say travel and being around different people is the reason for us to grow so that we won't be closed minded, then we have to be open to studying different religions, white people believe what they believe. It's just, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's so hard to understand why people, if you don't have, if you don't have different people around you, then you're going to believe whatever the media or whatever it is that you already have set in your mindset that black people can't afford luxury. So that's what you're going to go with. Mm -hmm. um, I think I find this so interesting in the travel industry in particular, because as you were saying, like we're, we're telling this story of the importance of connecting with other cultures and traveling and exploring and being a part of a global community. And so it does feel disjointed, um, especially in this space. And um, it is so important, like that is why I travel actually is to really enjoy learning about other cultures. And much like with your daughter, if I come up across something that I don't know about, I do grab a book or I try to, you know, reach search who is an expert in this field so that right. I can learn more so that I have a better understanding. Um, so I, I just, it feels, uh, it, it just feels like such a weird dynamic to have this conversation in a space, particularly uh, focused at creating global connections and cultural connections. And uh, so I really appreciate you. And, and I don't this. think travel makes people less biased. I know that's, it sounds good. And that's what, you know, you know, everybody says, you know, why do you love to travel? And it's because it opened my eyes to other cultures and makes you, you know, realize people are different and we're all the same. I don't think travel does that. I think people travel, they go to, especially Americans, we go to other countries and we look, we snob our nose up at people that don't do things the way that we do. You know, we take pictures with people in African villages as our prompts. Uh, and so I don't think travel make, 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 makes people less biased. I think travel, if you're already biased, you're not gonna be less biased because you travel to Mexico or to Costa Rica or to Africa, you're gonna be the same person. You're just gonna be like, ew, you, that's, that's all that that's gonna do. Yeah, um, thank you so much for sharing that because again, that like shines a light. We really get in our own 
focus, right? And when I travel, it is my intention to, uh, to connect in that way and to actually to shift my perception. Like I go in with that, with that in mind where, you know, I have stories when I have been in the Middle East and wanting to learn more about that culture. And now I have a really strong resonance with the community that I met there. And that's my first touch point. So instead of me having maybe an innate discomfort or an not understanding, I now have a real deep love and respect for that culture because of how I connected. But if you're traveling and you're going to an international resort that you can find everywhere where you don't know if you're in Cancun or Madrid or whatever, All the you are missing that, that piece. So it's really fair to say that it is not innate to every travel experience that you're going to have that awakening or shift or awareness. Right. So thank you for, for shining that light because I do get really tunnel vision because that's how I travel. And I forget often that there's a huge segment that isn't traveling in that way. Yeah, most people, they travel, they go to the, the resorts and they don't leave the resort. It's beautiful there. You have someone waiting on you hand and foot asking you, Mrs. Harvey, would you love another cocktail, my love? <laughs> and then I'm saying, yes, I would love another cocktail, please. And I don't leave off the beach or wherever it is that I am for the five days that I'm gone. And that's, that's traveling. But have you really experienced something other than you have some good pictures for Instagram? Yeah, I actually took my daughters to Mexico and I, I hardly ever stay at a resort actually. I usually try to stay at a VRBO or somewhere in the middle of a city, not, not so isolated, I guess, or I don't know, bubbled, however you want to say that. Right. And my one daughter was looking around one morning and she was like, didn't we come to Mexico? And I said, yeah, she's like, this just feels just like California or what, you know, I was like, wow, um, that is so brutally observant of you. Right. And so then we had a conversation about that and we talked about why it looked like that. And then that day we got a taxi and we went to a different part of town and um, met with some artisan groups. And I was like, okay, let's figure this out because right. I didn't want her creating that experience for travel. So um, what an interesting way to think about it. Um, I think another thing that, especially in the industry I'm in, which is more focused on adventure travel and um, sometimes really that rustic backpacking, you know, type of travel. I think there's also a myth that uh, that black travelers aren't looking for that type of travel or also solo travel sometimes gets lumped into that category. So if you could maybe help speak to that, like where are we missing the mark with that conversation? Yeah, especially with solo travel with the MMGY study that just came out. I believe that number is 80% it's a huge number. I think 80% of black travelers travel solo. And so, you know, we're not waiting on other people. We get out, we travel, um, even the adventure travel. One of my great friends is uh, Lauren Gay of the Outdoorsy Diva. And she has a huge adventure travel blog. And I think that, again, it goes back to myths that you know black people only do one thing and it's so not true people love adventure people love all of these different aspects of travel and again you know everyone that is listening you know i would challenge everybody that regardless of whether you are black white latina have a conversation with one somebody that is of a different race and ethnicity than you are and, 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 and a real conversation, not just, you know, to, to sort of that fluff conversation, but really find out because then you'll find out, oh, this person loves to ski. They go skiing, you know, every, you know, every winter. They're the first ones at the slope. This person loves kayaking. And, and I think that those, you will find that you know, we are not a monolith group of people. We like cover the gamut mm -hmm. when it comes to adventure, when it comes to travel, when it comes to our careers. And so I think that, and I keep saying that because I, I watch, I, I, and I try with the media, I try to look at, 
at all different spectrums of the media so that I don't have, my brain isn't tunnel vision on what it is that I believe. So I only listen to um, news that reflect what I already believe. You have to be able to widen your horizon and listen to other people. And I remember someone, um, someone said, this was a coworker actually, that, you know, black people need help understanding um, why it's important to travel. And I was like, <laughs> and so, but based on their view and what they have been taught and what they have listened to and learned, you have to sort of help educate people. And that's why we're doing this because if people don't know, they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And so I think having these conversations and helping people understand that you can't judge everybody by that same broad stroke, uh, even with the re even with regard to you know I've struggled this year with trying to keep my head above water with 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 not feeling as though all white people are Trump supporters and they want to see all and you know, Latinas go back to Mexico. They want all black people to go back to Africa. I have myself struggled and said, okay, you need to take a step back. You're list looking at too much news. So you need to turn that off. And you have real friends that are all different ethnic ethnicities. And so you can't allow the media to brainwash you into thinking something different. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It, it I mean, I think that is such a huge lesson to think about, and it's hard to for some people to understand how much, but just as we're speaking that the media and marketing is missing this segment in travel, we know that the media has a certain image that it, it paints, and I really spent a lot of time the last year, too, trying to uh, take perspectives, all the different perspectives to find like my version of the truth in the middle of them and what really aligned with my values and and then try not, not, not to get oversaturated with any of it because it's just so uh, intense, especially right now. So and travel um, brands have to really understand, they have to really understand, do they want that audience or do they want to check the box? to right. say that, yes, I did what I was supposed to do because those are two different things. Mm -hmm. You know, do you wanna, up, because people are so afraid of cancel culture right now. So they wanna check the boxes to say, yes, I did the black history thing. And yes, I had a black content creator on my feed. I had one, but you know, tokenism is alive and real. And so if brands don't really understand the why behind it's important to be inclusive, and not just to black people, you know, there's a whole Asian community out there that you don't hardly see in any marketing, mm -hmm. you know, look, you know, they only market to, you know, Latina people, you know, Mexican Heritage Month, and that's it, and Cinco de Mayo, and, you know, and we don't hear, we don't, you know, and th that's a huge population of people that brands aren't marketing to that have spending power. Yeah, um, that ties in so well to something we were talking about before we jumped onto this conversation. So we were talking about, you know, in this process, getting uncomfortable, kind of having messy conversations and just showing up, knowing that there's a, a point you have to grow through. And for me in my, in my brand and wanting to be inclusive, I wanna to speak to a diverse audience. Like I already know that's true about who I am. So that is in my why, when I bring groups of women traveling, I want all women to be there because the whole point is I want to create this connection and it is about every person. And on the opposite of that is that when I create my brand branding, I'm one person, I'm all the departments <laughs> and I sit down with my Canva and I'm pulling stock images or whatever, because I don't have a ton of images yet for my business. I have that moment of, okay, I, I, I know this is my intention is to be inclusive. I want to put the images of black travelers, travelers, Latina travelers, Asian travelers, because I want them to feel welcome in my community. 
And right now the audience I'm reaching is primarily white women. So how do I do that in authentic way? And it's, it's this, this balance that I haven't figured out. And I feel like if I'm going through that as a one person business, um, probably other larger brands are navigating that balance of authenticity, the market we want to reach, the market maybe we're currently reaching. How do we do that in an authentic way? What, what do you see as the maybe best foot forward in that situation? Well, we know for a fact that Black people do not, and I would suggest, I would probably say this is with other groups as well, but specifically Black people, we don't go anywhere where we don't see ourselves represented in marketing material. That's just, that is a fact. And so even with um, travel conferences is another huge deal where you don't see a lot of black people and you don't see a lot of black people there because they are not in the marketing material. So if you want to market to black people, they have to feel like it's going to be someone that looks like them at the conference Mm -hmm. and whether you have, yes, I would say, use um, stock photos. If you want to get that audience, you're going to have to show them that people are there. And once you get one or two on your trip, then take snap the hell out of pictures of them doing like everything so that you can use those photos moving forward. But we're not going to go anywhere where we don't see ourselves represented. And that is just how we operate. So if if, if I see a trip and I'm researching a trip and all of your pictures have white women having fun, I'm probably not going to feel comfortable. And I'm going to say, oh, I'll pass that up. But if I see some images where there is diverse or there are at least two Black people, maybe one Asian, so, there has to be some diversity. But if I see a group and it is 20 white women, I'm probably going to pass that up because I just don't want to go anywhere where I'm going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to have be these uncomfortable. Well, I would, in my mind, I'm thinking it's going to be uncomfortable conversations. I'm going to be the only black person. They are probably going to feel uncomfortable because they're going to have, don't know what to say. And, and then they get to asking questions. Oh, is it, is it, is it a holiday for you? Why, why are you here? Is it a special occasion? Like black people don't travel just because it always is, you know, a, a special occasion when we go somewhere and do something. Is it your anniversary, even though you're traveling solo? So yes, I would definitely say use stock photos. You have to have black people in, and I would make a call out to your audience and say, hey, ask any of the, the, the ladies that are there you know, do you have any black girlfriends that will love to come with you? I want a diverse um, audience and most, and some will probably say yes, and they will invite their black girlfriends. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I guess I really go from like not wanting to feel like I'm checking that box to like really showing up authentically. And then as you were saying, I'm like, it only makes sense. Like this is a total dumb moment. But if I were looking at marketing for a trip and it was all black women, I would be like, oh, I can't go on that trip. They, they would be like, why are you here? You weren't included in any of the marketing. Why did you think you could come? And I've even seen um, organizations that are empowering young women that really are focused on um, women of color. And I'm, I'm like, oh, I really want in on that conversation. It's really clear that I'm not included because I'm not in any of the images. So when and you same- take it down to that principle, like it makes so much sense. And it really does feel like um, it's not about being uh, inclusive or exclusive it's just about who you are showing is who is going to respond to the marketing so um what a beautiful awareness to come out of the conversation because I agree like I would feel exactly the same way and so that that makes so much sense and um I and really if you hope up to a trip so you did go and you showed up to a trip and there were 50 black people on this trip and you were the only white person you would feel a little uncomfortable. You would probably be like, um, okay, what am I to do next? And so you want people just as we want to see people that look like us. Mm -hmm. And again, and it just goes down to something as simple as if you were white, 
and you picked up a brochure, if the brochure didn't even say black only or Latina only or whatever the case may be, but if everybody on the brochure was black, you would probably say, uh, maybe this isn't for me. Even though it didn't say that on any of the marketing materials, it was open, but if everybody was on it was black, you would probably be like, um, I'll find something that has some low color in there some kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I feel like if anybody takes anything away from this whole conversation, it's that like revelation, which I'm sure you're like, oh yeah, that's so obvious. But I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't looked like I'd only been looking at for how I want to include people, but not how I would feel like looking at the marketing materials from a different perspective. And that's coming from my privilege that <laughs> everything usually is geared towards me and towards my, my group as a traveler. And so, um, yeah, that was super, super valuable. And, um, uh, I really appreciate, I really appreciate that. Um, I would love to, uh, to kind of talk a little bit more about, um, I have seen like what a gifted marketer you are for social media and engagement. I love following, especially passport and grubs, like I'm drooling over food and especially over things that I actually usually don't eat. And <laughs> I'm like, oh, I really want to try that. That looks delicious. Um, I would love to talk about how you kind of moved into this marketing segment, creating, um, helping brands create their marketing and why travel, I guess, is where I'm really getting at is like, how did, how did, I mean, you could be helping market any, any product. So why is travel the product you're marketing and what is it about that space that you love? So, you know, growing up, I grew up extremely poor uh, from a single parent home and I never went on summer vacations. I never had that luxury, you know, where people would go somewhere for the summer. And when I got old enough um, and I got my first job, I think I went to Las Vegas or something like that for the first time. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like different from Memphis, which is where I'm from. And from that point on, I sort of fell in love with like with with travel and seeing other places and going out of the country and seeing how other people um, lived and the foods that they ate and and what the food means to that culture. So I'm a big foodie, mm -hmm. and so I love finding out about the different cuisines that are attached to different cultures and why why they eat what they eat. And so that's why I actually started Passports and Grub. I was traveling, my husband and I were like going everywhere and people were saying, and I'm in, I do marketing for my day job and everybody was saying, oh my God, you all are always going somewhere, you should start a travel blog. And so that's where, and, and I wanted it to be luxury and upscale but I didn't want it to feel stuffy because I'm not a stuffy person. I didn't, I, I feel like sometimes marketing portrays luxury as this unattainable thing for everyday people. And so you must be uber wealthy in order to go to a nice result resort. So passports and grub passports was travel, of course, and the grub part, I wanted to like make it food because you say grub, I'm eating some grub or black people say that anyway, we say we've been a grub. And so I wanted it to be feel attainable. And so from there, I started growing my brand and I started getting some recognition and I started working with travel brands, helping them really understand why they need to market to black people, the revenue that they're missing by not marketing to black people um and that you know it's okay to show somebody black on your instagram feed i promise you your audience is still going to be there i know and so it's so it all just kind of you know came full circle for me on you know why i got into it why i love travel um and so you know that's it in a nutshell it wasn't this big epiphany um it's just something that evolved over time mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that is so similar to so many people that I've talked to is that 
like getting into travel actually takes a journey. Like we've all kind of like gathered all these passions and these skills. And then all of a sudden we're holding all these things and we're like, what do we do with it? And it's so weird that it just like I've seen and because I'm in this space, but it gets into travel. It like all makes sense that when you talk about using food to understand cultures and the land and the land that the food comes from, right. that automatically kind of lends itself to travel because you have to go there to have those experiences. And, um, and then when you're thinking about how you travel and why you travel and you have a marketing background, like then again, it makes sense to, to bring those things together. But I, I love seeing how those things, how those dots line up and then become at the end, like the thing that makes the most sense ever, but we didn't see it in the beginning when we're just, we're doing these things that we love. Um, so I think that for the, for the people that listen to, that's one thing that's really inspiring is to see how we can really pull our passions into our profession and we can take all the things we do and make them into like a cohesive part of our identity and our careers, which can you seem know, daunting. It's not too late. I, I, I'm still in the mid, middle of my pivot. So I'll be 50 years old in August. And so I am transitioning careers. And so I think that, you know, once you find out what, and I think too, we don't, at least back then, when I was in high school, it wasn't about finding your passion. It was, you go to college, you get a, you get a degree and you get a good job and you work. And so, you know, it, you know, I didn't realize what my passion was until I was in my thirties. You know, I knew I loved to travel and I was traveling, but I didn't realize I wanted to, to navigate or pivot that into a career. Mm -hmm. And so I still didn't do that. I started the blog, but I was like, oh, you can't make a living doing this. So I'm, this is just going to be my side hustle. And I'm just going to work really, really hard. And even now, you know, I'm at a crossroad right now of, you know, do you step out on that leap of faith and make this your full-time gig? Or, you know, do you keep trying to hustle and do too much, too fast, too soon? And so it's, you know, it's never too late. I think if you find out what your passion is early enough and not even early enough, just when you find out what your passion is, start making the plans on how you're going to pivot and how you're going to integrate that into your everyday life. Yeah, that's such good advice because we do think we also have like an expiration on a dream and we're like, nope, we can't go for that now. It's too late. And right. like, I can't wait really. I, I see myself like totally pivoting at like in my sixties to my next thing. I'm like, I wonder what that's going to be. It's going to well, be exciting. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And thinking about those career tests, I remember in high school taking one that's, it was supposed to kind of be like your purpose or your, like, what would you be best suited for? And I remember getting the results. I don't remember what they were, but I remember looking at it being like, there is no way no. I'm spending my life doing this. And so then, you know, definitely went to college, got the degree, tried to do all the things that we see we're supposed to do. And luckily travel kind of kept pulling at me. So I moved in that direction, but it can be really hard to honor that. And especially if you've carved out like a really great career in a, in one of those categories that you've checked all the boxes to right. then go ahead and say, actually, this is really out of alignment for who I am. And I would be better serving the world if I were writing a travel blog or, you know, becoming a dance instructor, whatever it might be yeah, that doesn't either. have that heft that some other category of career has. <laughs> yes, most definitely. And, and, and I think that, you know, we're just taught that you're supposed to check out all the boxes and, and, you know, it's life is oh, but so short. And so, you know, I made the decision that, okay, once my husband retires, you know, and we live a excellent life. I'm not, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, but I was like, okay, what can I do that I can start now 
that could be an income driver for us when we retire in, you know, less than seven years. And so that was another reason why I started the blog, because I know it takes time. I know, you know, it takes time to build up credibility and to become an authority. But I wanted, I was looking ahead saying, you know, we know we want to travel and how can I integrate travel into our retirement? Yeah. So, yeah, that's so it's great. And also I think, um, I just, I love so much the stories that you tell through your blog and through your, through your space, the platform that you do have. And um, like, for me, I really, I just like, I resonate so much with so many of your posts and I can see myself in them. So I love, like you were talking about being authentic, being relatable. Um, How do people bring that into their marketing, but how do we just show up as ourselves so that people can connect with us. And if you're in this space, that's really important and teaching brands to be able to do that in an authentic way. Um, We were also talking before, like both kind of operating from this space, especially in travel. And then this year, especially as women and mothers and all these things that have come at us in 2020, the myth that hustle equals success <laughs> and how do we bust that that there's not a badge of honor for like complete martyrdom and self-sacrifice and um I know we were saying that like myself I have felt the weight of that with having migraines with having just fatigue where at 4 30 in the afternoon I just like pass out making dinner and my kids are like what happened to you I'm like well right. I have so many things I'm doing. I'm insane right now. I don't know why I'm doing all of this, but because it feels like if I stop moving, I am no longer successful. Um, So I would love for you to step into this part of the conversation. If I stop moving, I have to write (laughs) that down. I'm no longer successful. Oh my gosh. I have to write that down. That was great. Okay. Yeah, you know, life caught up with me. I didn't even know if I was going to make your 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 show today. Um, I probably, doctor's orders, I shouldn't even be on here. <laughs> uh, but I'm at home, I'm in bed, uh, well, in my office. You know, I think that, you know, we are in a society, especially, I think it started really when the pandemic really hit. We already had this hustle mentality before the pandemic. And then with everybody being at home and on quarantine, if you haven't learned 18 languages, if you haven't learned, you know, how to build a spaceship, if you haven't learned how to do this, if you haven't learned how to do X, Y, Z, you've wasted a whole year of your life. There are no excuses. You should have learned how to do A, B, C, D, E. And everybody was everybody is just churning and churning and churning and churning. And we were more busy during quarantine that we had been. And society has told us that you need to work yourselves to death in order to be successful. You need to have 18 hustles. You need to have 25 streams of income. You need to be a super mom. You need to be a super wife. You need to be a super girlfriend. You need to be on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, What's the other one, the new one where everybody's talking now that I can't stand? Oh, is it Clubhouse? Clubhouse. You need to be on Clubhouse. I hate that thing. Oh my gosh. You need to be on Clubhouse. You need to be on every platform made to man and you need to be posting on every platform five times a day. Plus you need to be writing three, four blogs. Plus you need to be doing all of, and it's like, who can do that? Literally who can do that? And so last week I had, I suffered from migraines as well. I had a migraine for three days. And when I came home, the right side of my body, I lost mobility on the right side of my body. I fell, hit my head on the concrete steps coming in the house, had to be rushed to the ER. They thought I had a stroke. Um, But the migraine had caused the blood vessels in my brain to restrict, which mimicked a stroke. And so I was in the hospital for two days and 
So now I'm supposed to not to be doing anything for 30 days. No, nothing. I'm not, I'm supposed to be completely watching, binge watching Netflix is what I've been told to do for the next 30 days. But we have to realize that you can work yourself to death and then be dead. And then you haven't enjoyed any of the fruits of your labor. You know, we travel and we have to take all these pictures, but we're not really enjoying where we are because we're working. We're trying to like get the perfect photo for Instagram so you can go viral, but you haven't really stopped and enjoyed where you are. Like when, when will we like take time to say, we don't have to always be moving. We don't have to always be going. And especially as an entrepreneur, it is like, if I slow down, then somebody else is going to come in and take my place. So I got to keep going. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's so, it's difficult to say, and I'm like, even now, yesterday I was working on a blog post and I wasn't supposed to be, but I was like, I'm laying in bed. I'm not doing anything. I'm watching TV. I could be getting blog posts out while I'm, I'm, I'm in bed though. So, I mean, what's the, what's the harm? So, but when do we like really take time to like have self-care and what does self-care look like for, for each individual person? And realizing it's okay to say no, even when it's to our husband and our kids, it's okay to say, no, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. And no is a complete sentence. Yeah. Doesn't, okay. doesn't require any follow-up behind it. You don't have to give an explanation. You don't have to say no, but this is why the answer is just no. And so I'm, that, I'm, I'm learning that now. Um, I can't say yes to everything and everybody. Yeah. I started this year reading, I think it's on my desk. Yeah. Uh, Do Less by Kate Northrup. Mm. And that's where I have been like coming to this year from that space and kind of thinking of the idea. I think it was in that book. I've been reading a few at the same time, which is one of my bad habits. I'm like, oh, I'll relax by reading 12 books at the same time. Right. Not really helpful. Um, but it's the idea that when I say yes to you, I say no to me. Like I, I, we have to learn to be able to say no to somebody else so that we can say yes to like a long bath or reading one book and enjoying it. Or like I was even planning a long weekend to the mountains to just decompress and that I was like, oh, but so-and-so lives near there. And maybe I could actually get an interview with their husband that I was trying to talk to mm -hmm. last year. And, oh, there's this other person that was there. And then, oh, there's the spa that I've been wanting to look at for a retreat. And then all the, la, 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 la. and I was like, wait a second. You went down the rabbit hole before you even knew it. <laughs> I didn't even, I haven't even left on this vacation and I'm exhausted. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I think that there is so much value to look at again, kind of coming back to our why, like what does success even mean to me? What would I look like if I was successful? Would I be the person that could do all of those things? Or right. would I be the person doing one thing really well and having a super connected relationship with my daughters and my friends and my partner and, you know, like, redefining success so that we actually know what we're striving towards instead of this societal notion of success so right and and even with you know we have to get out of the habit of looking at other people and what they're doing and comparing ourselves to you know what other content creators are doing what other travel uh people are doing because you know instagram is not real and so you can't compare yourself to other people and trying to live up to other people's standards of success. Because like you said, is, you know, is that really your, what does success look like to you? And it may not be to have a million Instagram followers. And so why are you striving to have something that isn't even of value to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. I feel like we could kind of take that into its whole own conversation, but I love how it all kind of comes back to like knowing our why, showing up authentically, um, really modeling the way 
we want to live to others, um, sharing those stories so that people can learn. I mean, I really, I remember reading your post about that and I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm probably five minutes behind that happening to me. Like I literally had shaken off I don't know how many migraines this year and been like, I'm fine. I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm eating something weird and right. like getting to the end of the day and not being able to say a whole sentence because I'm just exhausted and being like, it's fine. It's fine. You're just going to do this for a few more weeks to get through this hurdle. And then, and then I'll rest, but then I'm going to pick up five other projects, five other projects. It won't ever be, <laughs> I'm going to rest. Yeah. And, and your and body will tell you, when it's had enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, your body will tell you when, when it, when it's had enough. And my body said, sit your bleep down. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, and then, right. <laughs> I really appreciate that you are um, going against your doctor's orders to be here for this today. Um, I did have that panic. I was like, oh no, she probably shouldn't be doing this. And I was so excited. I'm like, well, We'll see how this plays out. Um, so I am really, really grateful for you being here because I feel like this is such a valuable conversation in all aspects of this in a really important time for us to be aware of everything that we've talked about today, um, including nurturing ourselves. So I'm gonna just take a few more minutes of your time and then I will let you get back to that. <laughs> I'm not even dressed from the bottom down. I look at that, <laughs> I put on a shirt for you and put some makeup on, but I don't even have have any clothes on I was like that was like I don't think they'll be able to see the bottom part so I'll just stay as is so no worries I'm going to get right back in the bed good um well I have just some kind of fun rapid fire questions so our audience can get to know uh you a little bit more which especially they should go to your uh to follow you on your website and your Instagram and because I have loved it so much. Like since our initial conversation, I've honestly, I'm a bit smitten with you now that I followed you on social Thank media. You. So you're doing your job. <laughs> um, but these last questions are just kind of some fun, fun travel sort of questions. Okay. Um, what is your favorite book or movie that offers you a travel escape or inspires you to adventure? You know, it's going to be so corny because it's everybody's favorite. Um, what is the name of it? Um, no, I'm changing it. I was about to say something else, but have you seen the, the travel show? I don't know if I could say that on TV. It's, uh, oh, not on TV, on Facebook live, but it's F that's delicious. Oh, I have not seen it. <laughs> so it is a food show with a rapper. Um, it's the, he's a white rapper. He's really fat. Oh no, I'm going to be the worst popular culture questions. So. Okay, so then you need to go. This he has the best show ever known to man, and it's called F. That's delicious. F and then an asterisk and U C K. Yeah, that's delicious is the name of the show, and it's on Netflix. And it's him and his buddies, and they travel all over the world. It's not pretentious. I had never Morocco had been on my list but not in this sense. They went to Morocco and I swear to God, I was just looking at the TV like, as soon as this pandemic is over with, that is literally the first place on my destination. But you must check that out. It's called F That's Delicious. Excellent. I was actually watching Anthony Bourdain last night and I was missing that like way of traveling through food and culture and connection. And um, so I'll have to put that on the list. It is so good. I promise you, you will binge watch. You will binge watch every episode. It is so good. It is, and I already want to go to Morocco, so that's probably going to yes. add to the pain. <laughs> um, what is always in your suitcase? Swimsuits. Yes. Oh, and your pictures. I yes, because that's how you're going to get those beautiful pictures yes. of you on the beach. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, what is your favorite destination? Oh, we, they are, I have two and they're on two completely different spectrums. I don't even know. I, so Costa Rica, I love Santa Teresa, Costa Rica. And I think the Amalfi Coast is going to be, it's like, they're like right there together. 
Santa Teresa, Costa Rica, or the Amalfi Coast. I can't, when people ask me, I always say either one of those. It's a little town uh, on the Amalfi Coast called Pererno. I think that's how to pronounce it correctly. I don't know, but it is just, it's just, oh my gosh, the pictures don't really even do it justice. It's just gorgeous. The food. So let me tell you this quick story. I ordered some octopus at this little restaurant on in Pererno. And they sent this little old Italian man, like 80 years old, down in a rowboat in the middle of the Mediterranean. And he came back with an octopus. And they he called the waiter down and said, it's here. He went, got a bucket. And they came back up. And it was like a nasty black gook octopus in a bucket and they went cleaned it and brought it back to the table within like 15 minutes it was that was so amazing wow but, okay yeah uh -huh. that would be an amazing experience um let's see what uh where do you still long to visit besides morocco maybe <laughs> uh that i have never visited or yeah. that i have visited before that you've never visited i want to go to turkey I have never been to Turkey and Turkey is on my bucket list. That's uh, number one on my bucket list is to go to Turkey. Yeah. I really, really would love to go there too. Yeah. Um, where, what do you eat? Oh, this is such a good question for you. This is going to be impossible. What do you eat that immediately connects you to a place you've been? Uh, I think breakfast. I think that when you do you mean like breakfast or what do you what do you mean like what meal when you eat it just like takes you back to oh, a destination oh uh, so um uh mussels and pasta and just spaghetti sauce it, it just it's something very simple but when i have a great dish of just pasta and mussels or clam and just the olive oil sauce i immediately think I am back in Rome at this little, there was this little restaurant. We were supposed to be going to the restaurant across the street and it was, the line was wrapped around the building. It was all full of tourists and everybody was saying, this is where you should go. And it was going to be like a two hour wait. And we were starving. And then there was this little old man directly across the street from this famous restaurant and nobody was at his place. And I was like, let's just go over there. And it's funny, I bring this up because James, just my husband, just said, I wonder how your grandpa is doing. <laughs> so we went over there and he couldn't speak any English. I couldn't speak Italian. And he made this amazing dish that it was just pasta, spaghetti, spaghetti pasta with clams and, and mussels. And that was it. It was the best. And he saw my face when I took a bite and he came over and grabbed my cheeks and kissed <laughs> me on the forehead. And we like fell in love with each other. And he saw my face and he just was like, just kept kissing me and asking me, was it okay? It was like the most perfect meal that I've ever had. But when I have pasta and with clams, I think about him all the time. And my husband just said, I wonder how your grandpa is doing. Oh, that's so good. And I also love the idea that especially when we're not traveling, uh, whether it's now because we can't or just in the space and time when we're not traveling that that kind of is always available to us especially through food like food is just this magic gateway to all these destinations so it is i love that um uh let's see who was the person that inspired or encouraged you to set out and explore the world my best friend her name is wanda um we have been friends for 25 years I believe 25 years and so she's the first one that was like hey let's go here let's go there we have normally we have three girls trips a year with just she and I and uh we normally try to because she lives in Houston so but she's the first person that really inspired me to, to to get out and travel I love her dearly oh good well I hope you guys will be in Morocco soon I know, right? <laughs> um, if you could take an adventure with one person, fictional, fictional or real, alive or past, who would it be? Oh, I would probably go hang out with uh, uh, Auntie Oprah. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, that would probably open the door to some amazing travel experiences. <laughs> I so immediately, I, feel, I would want to go, I would want to hang out with her and Gail. I would want to hang out with Auntie Oprah and Gail. Yeah. That's, hey, if, Oprah, if, if you're watching Oprah, you never know. You never, you never know. Auntie Oprah might be watching and you don't even realize it. I'm here. I, I think she's watching. You. I know, right? Like, Wouldn't that be amazing? I, I, it would be amazing. I uh, also, yeah, that would be amazing. Let's just summon that to the universe. Um, well, I don't, yeah, I come to this point at every, almost every conversation where it's the end and I don't want it to be, but um, I really appreciate you being here even more so in the fact that you shouldn't be. So I appreciate that so much. Um, I love everything that we got to talk about and I just look forward to supporting your work in the future and uh, sharing more great stories. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am greatly appreciative of you reaching out, of you following me. I, I really, really am. I'm always humbled. Uh, I, you know, I, it's, it's hard sometimes because, you know, I even changed my Instagram from Passports and Grub to just Tamiko Harvey. Uh, because I am, you know, growing as a content creator and I want to talk about more than travel. And so, you know, sometimes I have those hard conversations that, you know, it's not all nice and you can't put a bow on it and it makes people think. And, and so, so I, I appreciate you going on this journey with me. I really do. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning that you were doing that. Um, if people want to be, and they should want to be following you, where can they find you? So uh, Instagram is Tamiko.Harvey. Uh, LinkedIn is Tamiko Harvey. And uh, Facebook is Tamiko Harvey as well. So I changed everything over, uh, which was a huge deal if you are a content creator to, to change your name, what everybody knows you by and sort of rebrand. So, but you know, I'm, 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 growing as a content creator while travel is still near and dear and will probably be most of what my content is. I do want to talk about self-care. I want to talk about women. I want to talk about, you know, traveling without your kids. And, you know, sometimes we feel like we have to take our kids everywhere we go. Nobody wants your kids, but you, they're going to be there when you get back. I promise you, nobody is going to steal your kids while you're gone. We don't want our own kids. So I talk about, you know, women, you know, feeling, going out and exploring the world without their family so they can relax and rest and have those self-care trips. So follow me everywhere, guys. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And we will definitely be in touch and sharing more soon. Thank you.